You might think that the message I have today is kind of a putting a, a cloth and, and squelching things. The song service has been beautiful, everything's been beautiful, this lovely testimony. Just think, he, he was paralyzed in that leg, paralyzed. And today he can jump. I, I wish somebody would kind of tone it down. Yeah. But today I'm going to preach on the unpardonable sin. I, I hope you don't think it's like, <laughs> what are you doing to us? But you know why? And I feel it was God that put this on my heart. Because there's a lot of people, they can sing these songs, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. And you know they're going to end up in hell because of this one sin. There's going to be more Christians in hell because of this sin that I'm going to preach about today. And you need to be warned. You need to be warned so you don't allow this sin in your life, all right? Father, right now, I just thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be able to share the word that you've put on my heart. Lord, you gave me the title in the very beginning. I was shocked. But it, then slowly, slowly, you added to it. I've never preached this sermon in my life. And so, Lord, I just ask that you will anoint it and speak to people's hearts. And should there be anyone here that, without realizing it, this area in their life needs dealing with, I pray that you're going to speak to hearts. Thank you, Jesus. In my name I pray. Friends, today... Do you realize what a marvelous God we serve? <laughs> All the singing and that testimony, how big he is, how great he is, and yet how loving and kind he is. How patient, how tender he is. There's no one that can compare to Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us he knows us by name. He knows how many hairs are on our head. You know, in the book of Exodus, we read of Moses, who was called by God. And he's crying out to God. All right. This is Exodus 33, 12 and 13. And Moses said unto the Lord, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and you have also found grace or favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace or favor in your sight, show me now thy way that I may know you, that I may continue to find grace or favor in your sight. You see, we see from these two verses, Moses was not content that God knew him, all right? Uh, he wanted to know God, and he wanted to know the ways of God so that he might please God. Um, I, I wasn't going to tell this, but it comes to me, so I'm going to tell it. When I first got married, and I was married to my husband for 68 years, and he's been gone almost four now, so it's been a long time ago when I first married him. I love breakfast, I don't know about you, that, that's my favorite meal of the day, breakfast. And, and my husband never really wanted breakfast, but he would eat it just to please me, you know. So I made a real American breakfast with, you know, bacon, eggs, fried eggs, toast, and, uh, all the trimmings. And I was so pleased with myself, and I sat the plate in front of him, and he looked at it and looked at me and said, what is this? And I got a shock. Well, it's bacon and eggs. Bacon? This isn't bacon, he said. This is raw meat. Well, the only way I'd ever 
seen it cooked as the way my dad liked it. You put it, zing, zing, out it comes. <laughs> zing, zing, out it comes. It, it, it didn't cook long, but my husband liked it till it was crisp and crunchy. I never made eggs that, I mean bacon that way again. When I found out how he liked bacon, I learned to make it the way he liked it. This is the way it is with God. You feel you know God, but do you really know him? Do you know what irritates him? Do you know what hurts him? Do you know what makes him angry? See? If you don't, you're going to be constantly stepping on his toes, if you know what I mean. Doing things that he doesn't like. And so Moses here is crying out to him and said, I want to know your, your ways. I want to know you. Reveal yourself to me, all right? And that way I can know I will please you and you will, I can continue to find grace in your sight. And you know what God answered? He said, my presence shall go with you. Now, I want you to realize, uh, I wonder if you could just raise this a bit uh, and, and make it firm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. I tend to lean on it and it pushes down, sorry. God is not interested in religious formalities, all right? He doesn't care, do you show up in church? Did you bring the right thing? Did you wear the right clothes? He's not interested in that. And we think as long as we come, we fill the chair, and every week we show up, we're doing good, all right? No, God is not interested in religious formalities. What he is wanting and looking for is relationship. He wants to bring us into his family. He wants us to become one of his children. And until we really have a change of heart and a change of life, till we are born again, I don't care, you can go to church 365 days a year, and it's not going to please the heart of God, all right? He not only wants relationship, he wants fellowship. He wants to talk with us, and he wants us to talk to him. He wants us to be close like this, all right? Now, my first point is, what is our God like? What is our God like, all right? The first thing is, he is a God of love. I think we all know that verse, John 3:16. You wouldn't think I still get nervous, but I do. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is love. There's a verse that's I said this so that we know this is how we come into relationship with the Lord. But there's a verse in 1 John 4, 8, all right, and it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God. You can claim you know God, but if you don't know how to be loving to people, nice to people, kind to people, all right, uh, it says you don't know because the nature of God is love. It says, for God is love. If you and I have received God, it means we have his nature in us, in our spirit. And if we don't know how to love people, it means we don't understand our God at all. We don't know God. God is love. The second thing is, what is our God like? He's a holy God. He's a holy God, all right? He will judge sin. And he's told us that over and over. If it's sin, he cannot accept it. 
I don't care how loving he is, he is a holy God and he will judge sin. But he will bless when we obey him. Amen. Maybe you could tone this down a bit. He gave us examples in the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition. That word admonition means warning. Warning. To warn us, all right, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's you and me. We're living in the last days right now. And so he's warning us, all right, that the stories in the Old Testament are not merely stories. They are to warn us what is acceptable to God and what is not. So I have given us two examples here, all right. Uh, I've first given you a good example, and that is King Hezekiah. He was a good God, a good king, all right? He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, all right? His father was not good. His father served idols. His father raised idol altars and so forth. But when Hezekiah came to the throne, he chose to follow God. You don't have to follow what your father and mother do if they're not doing the right thing. God has given all of us a, a choice, the power of choice. And everything we do is because we choose to do that. Nobody can force you. You grew up in an idol worshiping family. You don't have to stay idol worshiping. You grew up in a Christian family. You don't have to stay that way. You want to leave, you can leave. But Hezekiah chose to follow God. <clears throat> it says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. He clave unto the Lord. I can't do too much because I have a lot more yet I want to tell you, all right? The Lord was with him and he prospered. All right. He actually was on the throne for 29 years, but in the 14th year of his reign, all right, the king of Assyria came. Now, the king of Assyria had taken away the 10 tribes, all right, and now he wants to take this, the tribe of Judah as well. And so he came and he made siege around the uh, the city of Jerusalem, all right? Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord. He cried out to the Lord for help. He put on sackcloth and ashes and he sat there and wept before the Lord. And you know what the Lord did? God sent his angel. And that night, in one night, just like that, he killed 185,000 soldiers that were laid siege around Jerusalem. And the next morning, they were all dead men, all right? Whoa, that's because Hezekiah loved God, did what God wanted, and God blessed him and ministered to him. You know, there was a day that, this isn't on my notes, but I think it'll fill in, um, Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, set your house in order because you're going to die and not live. And he turned his face to the wall and he wept and he cried and he said, oh God, I don't want to die. I, I don't want to die now. I never fully understood it. He didn't have any children up until then. I don't know if you realize that. All these years, it wasn't until I was nine years old that I finally see the truth. Why he cried to God. God said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. And during that 15 years, Manasseh, his son, was born. But oh, Manasseh was a bad king. Better he hadn't been born, so to speak. Whoa, he made the whole of Judah to sin. And, you know, while Hezekiah was king, 
He pulled down all the idol altars that his father had built. He got rid of them and he built up the house of the Lord. But Manasseh, when he came in, and he was only 12 years old when he came, but he was back from the word go. He tore down everything that had to do with God. He built up everything that his father had torn down. He caused Judah to sin in a way that nobody else had ever done, all right? And he did that which was evil. I'm going to read what I wrote down in the sight of the Lord. He built up the altars and high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down. He made his children pass through the fire. That means he offered them to the god of fire, Molech, like the Canaanites, all right? He used witchcraft and charms and uh, followed, you know, the wizards and he followed all the heathen nations. And in one of those chapters, it says he filled Jerusalem with the blood of innocent people. He made them do these religious things. He insisted that the people had to follow his way of worship. And those that didn't, he killed them. And it says the blood was from one end of Jerusalem to the other. He filled Jerusalem with the blood of innocent people. There was no reason for them to be killed except they wanted to follow God. They didn't want to follow these idols. Oh, he was a wicked man. You know, he, it, the Bible says he did worse than the heathen nations. All right. God even sent his prophets to talk to Manasseh and to talk to the children of Judah. They wouldn't listen to the prophets. That he just was determined. He built idol altars and things inside of God's temple. So wicked. You know what God did? God allowed the Assyrian king to come and take him captive and carry him away. Well, he had been following all these different gods from these different nations. But now that he is a prisoner, whoa, I mean... Uh, you know, he could take it, and his eyes got open. And let's go over here to um, Second Chronicles thirty-three twelve. All right, when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. In other words, Manasseh repented after all those years, after all the wickedness that nobody before or after him sinned in the way that he sinned. You know, when he cried to God, you would have thought God would say, well, I warned you. If <laughs> you didn't want to listen to my warning, tough luck, on. I'm sorry, but there's no there's no remedy for you. No, 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 no. Our God is not only a God of love. Our God is a God of ho holiness. But our God is a merciful God. He's a merciful God. If you haven't passed that line of no return, anytime you repent of something you've done, he will forgive you. You can never do something so bad he won't forgive you. He is a merciful God. So what is our God like? A God of love, a holy God that can't accept sin. But if we will repent and acknowledge no matter what it is, he is willing to forgive. It says in 30, uh, verse 13, and he prayed unto him, and he, God, was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Who ever heard of being taken captive and then set free and brought back? No, that's what God did. When he finally repented and said, oh God, I've been wrong, 
I've been wrong. You are the true and the living God. Have mercy on me. God had mercy on him, and he was allowed to go back and become king again. And it says, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Wow. I don't think any of us can do some of the horrid things that he did. So whatever we've done, remember, our God is merciful if we truly repent. So I, I want to read a couple of verses to us that's God's promise to us before we go to point two. Isaiah 55, 7 says, let. That means, let means be willing. You have to be willing. Remember, he gave us a free will. Nobody can force you to do anything. Don't blame anybody for anything. You have made your own choices, whatever it is, all right? Let the wicked forsake his way. Who are the wicked? Let's get it straight right here. The wicked are not sinners that don't know God. Those are sinners. They're totally, they don't know God. They don't know what they're doing, whether it's right, wrong, indifferent, all right? But the wicked are people who claim to know God. They claim it with their mouth, but their lifestyle, they live it like people that don't know God. They live it like the world. Those are the wicked. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Our way is our walk, how we behave, what we do, but our thinking is inside of our brain, all right? Forsake it. And let him return unto the Lord, and he, God, will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That abundantly pardoned. All right. I, I thought of another verse. I don't think you have it. So I just, this was last minute. Proverbs 28 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. If you pretend there isn't anything there, you act like everything is okay, you, you won't prosper. But whoso confesseth, and forsaketh, all right, it says, them shall have mercy. It's not enough to say, I sinned, God. We have to turn our back to forsake something. All right, let, let me say it like this. I'm a mother, all right, of course, my children are grown up. But when they were little, if I go to the grocery store, have I forsaken my children because I didn't take them? No. But if I take them with me and one of them I leave there on the street corner, I say, stand up, I'll be back in just a moment, but I never come back again. That's called forsaking. Turn your back on it, all right? And so it says here, just to say, Lord, I'm sorry I've sinned. No, no. You won't get that mercy. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh, turns his back on it, never to go back again. He doesn't plan to go back anymore. God will have mercy. And that's what happened to Manasseh. Though he was a terrible king, though he did horrid things, suddenly he realized, oh my God, that I chose the wrong way. I don't want that way anymore. And he forsook him. Now, all those people that died, they didn't get resurrected, you know. Uh, the ones he led astray, I don't know if they came back to God. That, that's a different story altogether. But for him, when he turned his back, God forgave him. Let's go to point number two. I call this the sin that God warns us against, all right? And that is the sin of unforgiveness. When I say the unpardonable sin, 
I am seeing unforgiveness as the unpardonable sin. I'm not going into what unpardonable sin is. According to the verses I'm going to read you, that it is an unpardonable sin. When you and I have been forgiven by God and somebody does something, they borrowed money, they never paid it back, they broke in your house, they hit you, they did this, they did whatever they did, and in your heart it's like, I can never forgive them. That is the unpardonable sin. And God is warning us about it, all right? Let's look at the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read verse 12, 14, and 15, all right? It starts out with um, our Father which art in heaven, all right? Hallowed be thy name. But then we get down to verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Woo. This tells me God's forgiveness all right, in this Lord's Prayer is a conditional forgiveness. He doesn't just say, whatever it is, I'll forgive you. No, if, 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 that's a condition, all right? If you forgive others, then God will forgive you. If you refuse to forgive other people, God will not forgive you. And that means from that moment on, friends, Whatever, you know, we, in one day, I guarantee you, we sin many times in our thinking, in our looking, in our hearing, in our saying, and all the sins pile up. But as long as we're pleasing God, it says the blood of Jesus keeps washing, keeps washing it away. But when it comes to this forgiveness, if in your heart, you harden your, no. Or you say, I just can't. I can't. I can't. A lot of people say that. You don't know what they did to me. If you only knew what they did. No, no. God said, if you don't forgive, from that moment, that very day, your sins just keep piling up, piling up, piling up. They're not forgiven. They're not free. I don't care if you come to church. I don't care if you weep and cry. I don't even care if you fall down and it looks like you're under the power of God. You can do all you want. When you die, you're going to hell. I'm just going to talk it straight. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There is no room for eternal security. Please forgive me. You who go to a church that teach eternal security, there is no such a thing in the Bible. Hello? Hmm? Your security is abiding in Christ. And you cannot abide in Christ and continue to sin. There is no such a thing. When we are in Christ, it says we cannot sin. That doesn't mean you can do anything as it's not counted as sin. That means as long as you're abiding in Christ, you're unable to sin because Jesus cannot sin. If you do sin, which most of us, once in a while, something happens, we lose our temper, we get upset, we different things. I'm not going to try to think of all the different things. You can think of your own. But when you do one of those things that you're told in the Bible not to do, immediately it tells you you're not abiding in Christ. It means you've come out from under the blood of Jesus. It means you have given into your flesh, and the flesh is sin. Oh, friends, let's wake up. Let's not let the devil lie to us 
and make us think we can do wrong and it's acceptable to God. God is a holy God. He will not accept it. We must forgive our debtors if we're going to be forgiven. Let, let's go to the Lord's instruction, another portion. Mark 11, 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. When you pray, so this tells me unforgiveness hinders our prayers from being answered. Others might not know it, but if you have unforgiveness in there, you can pray all you want, but it's not being received in heaven. And God is not answering you. Right? Uh, you know, um, I remember this lady, this is when I lived in Penang, that's about 50 years ago. She was a Catholic. I actually met her in uh, a Catholic um, Holy Spirit meeting. I don't, they didn't call it that, but uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody invited me there, and she was a, rel a relative to the priest, I remember. And we became good friends, and then I was teaching a Bible study once a week, and uh, at the day one, Sri, and she started coming to my Bible studies. So she came one day and she said, you know, she had a, a, an x-ray and it showed the base of her spine, three inches had already disintegrated. And the doctor said it was because of the heavy medication she was on and she would eventually, the, the spine would just get eaten up. And then he said, you'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. So she said to me, she said, I would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've never received it. And I would like to be healed, all right? And uh, would you and your husband come to my house and pray for me? So the two of us went to her house. When we got there, just before we were going to pray for her, the Lord said to me, she has a lot of unforgiveness in her heart. So I thought, whoa, our prayers aren't going to get answered and let so, you know. I didn't tell her, God said you have. I asked her the question. I said, do you have anybody you need to forgive? God told me she did. But you know what her answer was? No, I've forgiven everyone. I said, Lord, now what do I do? In my heart, I didn't say it out loud, in my heart. And the Lord told me. He said, ask her if she's ever been hurt. So I said to her, have you ever been hurt by anybody? Oh, yes, so many people. Well, I said, you know, if you've been hurt, the only way you're going to be healed of that is to choose to forgive. And she understood that, and she, I'm telling you, I think we took about almost five, five minutes, you know, for her to, the names just kept coming. This one hurt me, that one hurt me. Choose to forgive them, I should. Now, she didn't recognize she needed to forgive in order for that hurt to be healed. See, a lot of people don't realize that. They'll just say, no, 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 I don't need to forgive anybody. No, if you've been hurt, to be healed of it, you need to forgive them. Then God will take care of that hurt. So once she had gone through her list, prayed, and you know, then my husband and I laid hands on her. We anointed her with oil, and um, she actually was baptized in the Holy Spirit. She began to speak in other tongues. Then we prayed for her healing, uh, it didn't, you couldn't see anything, but she was so happy when we left. 
The next week she came to my Bible study and she was beaming from ear to ear. And I said, why are you so happy? She brought along another x-ray. The first x-ray showed that much of her spine had disintegrated. The second x-ray, the spine was full and complete. God had replaced it. Amen. You can clap that way than that. And I'm telling you, it, God is a marvelous God. He is a marvelous God. I saw her many years after that, and she was still healed. Amen. Healed. Completely healed. But because she got rid of all that unforgiveness in her heart. All right. We're going to go now to Matthew 18. It says, Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often... Do I need, my, if my brother sins against me and I forgive him, how, you know, how many times do I have to forgive him? What if he comes the second time, the third time? Do you think seven times in one day is okay? And Jesus said, no. He said, 70 times seven in one day? Hello? I don't think any one person's going to commit 490 sins against you in one day. In other words, it doesn't matter how many times they keep stepping on your toes, doing what makes you get angry about, hurting your feelings, da, da, da. never mind, keep forgiving, keep forgiving. That's what it's saying, all right? And so Jesus said to him in verse 23, this is what we call the parable of the unforgiving servant. I want you to listen carefully. I am now 92 and a half years old and I only found out what I'm gonna tell you this year. All this time I've read, I've preached from the unforgiving servant and all it meant to me was one owed a lot and one owed a little. But I'm going to go in detail with you today, all right? When he began to reckon, one was brought unto him that owed him 10,000 talents, all right? And it's because he didn't have the money to pay, his Lord said, sell him, sell his wife, sell his children, everything that he has, and I will take it all. The servant fell down before him and worshipped him and said, oh, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. No, you won't. <laughs> Do you know how much 10,000 talents is? It's a lot more than the other guy did, by definitely. And that's all I knew. This was 10,000. The other is 100 pence. And it didn't really mean anything to me. So do you know what I did? All right, but let's read this 27, all right? The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him that whole debt, all right? I wrote to Google. I said, how much is 10,000 talents? I was shocked when the answer came back. Listen to this, and it's talking about in U.S. I don't know why, but it said U.S., all right. How much is 10,000 talents? 200,000 years of labor. 200,000 years of labor. 60 million work days and US dollars it is 3.48 billion I never knew it was that much till one day when I read and one lady said it would take how many lifetimes and I thought you must be exaggerating that's why I went to Google oh and then I saw this 200,000 years 
of laboring, laboring. I mean, we only live at the most 100 or so now, isn't it? Two. There's no way that man could pay it. This parable is representing God. That's what God has done for you and me, friends. There's no way that we can ever pay God. It says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. All right. It says, and the wages of sin is death. There's no way you can pay for me. I cannot pay for you because I have my own debt to pay for. But because of Jesus, God, and I, all I can think of is the Chinese word, bai bai lao shu woman. It means it freely forgave us. Freely forgave us. Let it all go. There's no way you can ever pay him back. He forgave you everything. Now, it says, but that same servant that was forgiven all of that went out, found one of his fellow servants that owed him 100 pence and laid hands on him, took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe me. And that fellow servant fell at his feet, said the same words he said to the king. Oh, oh, he says, have patience with me and I will pay you. How much is a pence? It's a day's wages. It was called in the Greek a denarii, all right? A day's wages. 100 denarii is the equivalent of four months wages. Four months. You ask 5,800 compared to 3.48 billion. What was the Lord's response? He had it brought in and he called him. He said, oh, you wicked servant. You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me to do it. Shouldn't you have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry, wrath, full of anger, all right? Delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. He put him away and in a place where he was tortured and tormented. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, all right. Who are the tormentors? Because it says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So who, if this is a spiritual issue, who are the tormentors? They're evil spirits. I remember one time, I don't remember where I was, um, but I was in church and this lady came to me and um, she said, would you pray for me? You know, I, I have a pain, it's really bad here. So I prayed and while I prayed, the pain left. And I thought she, you know, I could tell, I could tell by her face that the pain had gone. And then just when I was going to say, let's rejoice, the prayers answered to, oh, oh, please pray. I've got the pain here. I prayed for that. It left. Here, here. I mean, from one place to, I stopped praying. I said, you have unforgiveness. You have unforgiveness. She had been given over to the tormentors. So you pray for one place, when it was gone, it jumped to another. Pray for that, it would go to another place. The tormentors put pain on her until she couldn't bear it. But she had unforgiveness in her heart, all right? I remember, um, it doesn't always come immediately, all right? 
I remember a time when my husband and I had some kind of a <laughs> misunderstanding and um, we were both quite angry. I was really angry. <laughs> Anyways, in the end we decided to make up. So we said sorry to each other. I forgive you, I forgive you, all right. You know, 20 years later, a pain came into this right wrist. Um, I'm right-handed, so it was quite bad. I mean, it was excruciating pain. And, and I, I prayed, 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 nothing happened. So I cried out to God. I said, why am I not getting forgiven? And you know what God said to me? God told me this. He said, do you remember 20 years ago, you and your husband had a, a clash? I said, yes, but we forgave. He said, Fred forgave you from his heart, but you never forgave him. You held it all this time. And now, because that left an open door, I suppose because I said sorry, you know, outwardly it looked, and God never did anything, but it left an open door. So when I got, I don't know how, but 20 years later, immediately I said, God, I didn't realize that, that I thought it was from my heart. Well, when I thought back, I thought, yeah, I used to turn my back to him in bed. You know what? I asked God to forgive me. I said, from my heart, I want to forgive him. I got a hold of my husband immediately, and I told him what was said. He said, but we settled that. I said, yeah, God said you did it from your heart, but I didn't. Now I do it from my heart. And once I forgave from my heart, I've never had that pain ever again. The door was shut. I was under the blood of Jesus. So remember, when you give in to your flesh, you are leaving an open door for the devil to attack you, all right? The way to forgive is my third point, all right? It is not trying to forgive. It is not by my feelings, all right? Don't say, I just can't forgive. You don't know what they did to me. I No, 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 I just can't. No, the way to forgive is to look to Jesus and depend on Jesus. It tells us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. All things. It doesn't matter what it is, I can do it through Jesus, all right? And we have Paul's example, all right? 2 Corinthians 2.10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it, in the person of Jesus Christ. Notice that. Paul says, I cannot forgive on my own but in the person of Jesus, by abiding in Christ, by looking to him, allowing him to forgive through me. All right? Yes. And it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Anything by our own effort, anything that's done in our own strength, is flesh. Flesh is sin, and the devil has a right to attack us. The, that's how he gets to you and me, when you please the self, when we lean on the self, when we try to do things on our own, instead of abiding in Christ in the realm of the spirit. It opens the door to sickness and to Satan's attack. I'm now starting my conclusion. As some have already left, I guess it's too late for them. 
uh, we'll start our conclusion. Proverbs 29.1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, all right, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy, all right? I how many of you have heard of a man called John Bevere? Uh, he, he writes books, all right? The Devil, Satan's Faith. There's a few other. He's written quite a few. Anyways, many years ago, when we were still pastoring in Elam Church, uh, VFC, which is, this is like a branch from VFC. Uh, they were having a church camp and they had several speakers for their camp. So my son was the head of VFC, uh, Pastor Rick, and he said to my husband, how would you like John Bevere to come and preach for your Sunday service? Of course we were very happy for him to come. And he spoke on unforgiveness. I can remember, he never stayed up there, he went down and with his finger, he was under everybody's nose. And he was just really at it, I'm telling you. And then he told this story. He had a friend who was an evangelist, he went everywhere as an evangelist. And this evangelist told him of a vision that God gave him. God took him, all right, uh, and took him to heaven, showed him all of heaven. Then Jesus took him down to hell and showed him hell. And as he was walking around this terrible pit full of fire and the screams of people were coming out, um, his eyes got big. As he looked into that pit of fire, it was his mother-in-law. He saw his own mother-in-law who had already died, and she's in hell. And he turned to Jesus, and he said, how could you send her to hell? She was one of the most spiritual women in the church. Jesus looked sad. He said, I never sent her to hell. When she was a little girl, her brother did something. He didn't tell us what it was somehow sinned against his sister. He said, from the time that happened, I was speaking to her. Every year I was speaking to her, forgive him, forgive him, forgive him. She wouldn't. Oh, she was spiritual. The whole church felt she was spiritual. She was the head of this department, head of that department. She went to every service. She, they considered her one of the most spiritual women in the church. And there she was, burning in hell. And Jesus said, I didn't send her there. I begged her, I pleaded with her to forgive her brother, she would not forgive him. She sent herself to the fires of hell. Last but not least, I'm gonna list the three things, the price of unforgiveness. Number one, our prayers are not answered. Number two, our sins are not forgiven. Number three, our wall of protection has been totally removed. Friends, is it really worth it to hang on to that unforgiveness? I don't care what they've done to you. I don't care what they've said to you. I don't care how they behave towards you. Is it worth it to hang on to your unforgiveness? When Jesus forgave you everything, so much you could never, ever, ever pay him back. Why don't you come to him? 
Give it all to Jesus. Give your memories. Give the things that have happened. Give the hurts. Give it all to Jesus. Admit that you cannot, but say, Jesus, I look to you. You forgave me, and you can help me to forgive. He will forgive you. He will enable you. He will set you free. Shall we bow our heads right now? Spirit of the living God, you have forgiven us so much. We could never, ever, ever think of paying you back. And if we abide in you, you will help us do the impossible. When we've been hurt beyond measure and we feel it's impossible to forgive, maybe they cheated us out of our home, cheated us out of hundreds and thousands of dollars, whatever it is, Lord, nothing compared to what we owe to you. You will help us to forgive if we're willing to come to you. Lord, I don't know who's in this group, but I don't want anybody to go away thinking, you're a wonderful God, I know him, he's my savior, and yet they have unforgiveness in their heart towards somebody. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if the Lord is reminding anyone here of some incident in your life that you have never forgiven from your heart, why don't you turn to him and say, Jesus, I release it to you. Do for me what I cannot do. I'm willing to forgive through your power, through your strength. It isn't based on feelings. It doesn't matter what your feelings are like. You choose, you make a choice to look to Jesus and in the person of Jesus to forgive whoever has hurt you lied to you, cheated you, taken advantage of you, shamed you, made you angry. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's anyone here that you would like to raise your hand and say, God has reminded me of someone I need to forgive. We'll pray and you, you will be set free. Don't hang on to it. You hang on to it, remember what God says. If you don't forgive from your heart, he can't forgive you. If he doesn't forgive you, it's going to be terrible. You will end up in hell. There is no hero. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes, yes. I'm going to ask those that raised their hand and those who didn't, but they feel they should have, I'm going to ask you to come up here, line up here, and we're going to say a prayer 